Hello, this episode is sponsored by Spoken. They specialise in helping busy people improve their English for professional purposes in a really convenient way. With Spoken, you can get tailored and flexible English lessons from your teacher delivered directly to your phone with messaging services like WhatsApp or WeChat. The guys at Spoken are offering you two free lessons and then 20% off all of their courses. To check it out and to automatically get that discount, go to getspoken.com slash LEP or click a Spoken logo on my website. You're listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk. Hello and welcome to the podcast. Here is just a quick announcement before we begin, and that is that uh, Luke's English Podcast listeners are getting together in Prague for a meetup on Saturday the 13th of May at 4 o'clock. Uh, somewhere in Prague, I'm not sure exactly where it's taking place, but there is a, a Facebook page uh, for this event, and you can find it just by searching Facebook for Lepster Meetup in Prague. And it's hosted by uh, Zdenek Lukas, and it's happening on the 13th of May, Saturday. And the plan is uh, that this is an event for fans of Luke's English Podcast. Come and practice your English talking about uh, the podcast and other things, uh, drink beer and play board games. So if you're in the Prague area, just find the event on Facebook and click that you're going and then get together and have lots of fun. Hello, welcome back to Luke's English Podcast. How are you? You're fine. Um, Welcome back to the show. Here is some uh, more content about British TV. Um, And this time it's all about cars because I'm going to be talking about uh, the television show from the BBC called Top Gear. A car show. It's not just a car show, though. It's really a kind of comedy entertainment show with cars. And it's perhaps the BBC's most popular show for a long time, certainly one of their biggest exports. Uh, You've probably seen it. Uh, It travels well, Uh, no pun intended. Uh, But the show generally travels quite well, which means that it's popular in uh, different countries around the world. And um, uh, I think that you can see it on television in many places. In fact, you might be well aware of it. You might have seen it uh, on your telly or on the internet or something. So Top Gear, you know the show. It's these three guys, these three middle-aged guys, and they're a bit sort of mischievous and a little bit like politically incorrect. And they're lads and it's like lads banter, like blokes talking about blokey things. And it's cars and it's explosions and it's swooping noises and it's the sound of engines. And it's also the sound of kind of witty, uh, slightly offensive banter between three kind of guys who should know better. You know, that's basically Top Gear. It's lots of cars, fast cars that you could never possibly afford to, to buy yourself. You, you know, you never, you hardly even see some of these cars in your life. Uh, but it's about these, the most expensive, most sort of ridiculous vehicles uh, that, you, that you can get. That's Top Gear. And a lot more than that is all sorts of other things that go on in the show. It's quite a complicated show. Very popular, of course. Uh, also a little unpopular with some people. Um, some people really don't like it and uh, it's been criticised in the past. Um, but uh, certainly an interesting show and a significant one. Um, and people keep asking me for, to do an episode about Top Gear. I've had lots of requests for this one. So, OK, let's go. Let's do it. What you're going to get in this episode, uh, here's an overview. Uh, first of all, I'll give you kind of the story of Top Gear, because I remember watching Top Gear on television when I was a kid, and it was quite different. So it's gone through a couple of changes over the years. Um, and also, I'll be talking about um, the sorts of things that you get on Top Gear, the typical content that you might get, and also the way that they speak on Top Gear. So I, I will teach you how to speak like Jeremy Clarkson, uh, and we'll go into that in a in a bit. Um, also, we'll listen to a few clips from the show, which you can find on YouTube, and we will kind of look at the language that they're using there to talk about cars or talk about other subjects, because it's not just cars. Other bits and pieces come up as well uh, in, in their episodes. Uh, so we'll look at some language from their, from the clips, and then also we'll look at the uh, criticisms of Top Gear and the sort of the things that they've done wrong in the past. So what about the story of Top Gear? Well, I think it's been on 
uh, the television since the 1970s, maybe earlier than that. And Top Gear all always used to be this kind of typical BBC show which really lived up to the whole sort of um, ethos of the BBC, which was to educate, entertain, and inform. And that's, you know, the I think the, sh- the previous Top Gear used to be more informative um, and educational than pure entertainment. And it was mainly about giving consumer advice. If you are buying your first car or if you're buying a second-hand car, you know, what are the signs to look for? What, how should you do it? And also reviewing uh, the, the cars that, that most people could buy, you know, the standard cars by the standard companies. They would review them and give them road tests and things like that. And it was very sort of focused on giving you practical, useful advice to help you become a better motorist. Uh, that was the idea of it. And it was good. I mean, I used to watch it. Lots of people used to watch it. They had some interesting features about different cars and things. And it's always been a very well-made show. But it did sort of become a little bit sort of boring. And and it started also to sort of become almost like a parody of itself after a while. You know the way in, I guess, broadcasting or, you know, media that when a, a particular style of broadcasting comes into fashion, eventually it starts to become a, a bit sort of, um, what's the way, like, almost like a caricature of itself that it starts to exaggerate. And that happened with Top Gear and you ended up with these very sort of uh, hyperbolic reviews of cars using the most jumped up uh, statements, the hugest of exaggerations. You know, this is the most beautiful car I've ever seen, you know, just really over the top statements um, and not that kind of ironic either. Just pre- pretty straight, taking itself a bit too seriously. In fact, at times it used to come across as being almost quite smug. It's like, I know everything there is to know about cars. Here's an example of um, what it used to be like. Here's, here's what Top Gear used to be like. And this is a presenter called uh, Quentin Wilson, who was the sort of archetypal, I guess he was fairly posh guy who was an expert on cars. And he had this particular way of speaking. There was a time when off-roaders used to be special. If you drove a Range Rover, you had some serious juice. Old money, country seats, shooting sticks and deer stalkers. But not anymore. There are four by fours decorating the driveways of every Barrett housing estate. In fact, they're being driven by all sorts of people. So he's talking about four by fours. You know, these are cars that have four wheel drive. He's talking about four by fours and how um, these days they're not special anymore because everyone's got one. You know, and so basically he's saying that all the 4x4 cars are now just boring because everyone's got them, except for the Jeep Cherokee. And so he's now going to start talking about the Jeep Cherokee and how just amazing it is and how brilliant it is. So here we go. This is him talking about the Jeep Cherokee. And when he, when he does mention the Jeep Cherokee, just listen to the way that he says it in this kind of really smug kind of way. The best 4x4 by far is the Jeep Cherokee. Just listen to the way he does it. And the reason why we bought them all in the first place was they made us feel special, made us feel different. We liked that exalted imperial driving position, that buccaneering, get-to-anything spirit of adventure. But alas, they are all over the place now. Most are as interesting and as shapely as a haversack. Let's face it, 4x4s are now as common as the Spice Girls. Except one, that is. The Jeep Cherokee. The Jeep Cherokee. Um, Let's just have a listen to that little section again so you understand what he's talking about. Uh, He was talking about the appeal of uh, 4x4s. And the reason why we bought them all in the first place was they made us feel special, made us feel different. We liked that exalted imperial driving position. We liked that exalted imperial driving position, uh, meaning the raised driving position that you get in a 4x4. We liked that uh, exalted imperial driving position. Yeah, that just means it's nice to drive in a high position. 
Uh -huh. Imperial driving position, that buccaneering, get-through-anything spirit of adventure. That buccaneering, get-through-anything spirit of adventure. A buccaneer is like an adventurer. So that buccaneering, get-through-anything spirit is the kind of attitude that you need to drive a 4 by 4 Let's just, you know, we can get through it, we'll be fine. Yeah. But alas, they are all over the place now. Most are as interesting and as shapely as a haversack. Most are as interesting and as shapely as a haversack. Oh, my God. Taking the metaphor really too far. He's basically saying uh, most are what? What was it? Most are... Most are as interesting and as shapely as a haversack. Most are as interesting and as shapely as a haversack. A haversack is basically a bag. Uh, not very interesting. Just a kind of sh um, shapeless bag. So he's saying that most of the other 4x4s are as interesting and as shapely, meaning sort of beautiful to look at, as a haversack. Uh, over the top. I mean, imagine actually talking like this in your normal life. You know, going into a bar and going, yes, yeoman, I, I intend to purchase from you a pint of your finest frothing nut brown ale, my good sir. Let's face it, 4x4s are now as common as the Spice Girls. As the Spice Girls. Except one, that is. The Jeep Cherokee. Yeah, <laughs> the Jeep Cherokee. And then it's playing Born in the USA by Bruce Springsteen. While uh, Quentin Wilson is driving this Jeep around the rainy, wet streets of Warwickshire. Ah, uh, that's what Top Gear used to be like. Then it basically went through a kind of change sometime around 2002. And uh, the new Top Gear was um, brought onto the TV. And they changed it in a few ways. I think Andy Millman, the producer of the show, I think was the one who kind of um, made most of the changes. And essentially, they kind of changed the format of it. They stuck to just three regular presenters. So it was Jeremy Clarkson, James May and uh, Richard Hammond. And um, it's kind of a mixture of, of different things that you get on the show. But, that, but by changing the setup, putting it in a studio with an audience there, giving it this live feeling, and then by focusing in, instead of, well, instead of focusing on the cars that everyone can afford to buy and giving people advice on those cars, instead they just turn their attention on the cars that, you know, none of us can afford, which are totally extraordinary, out of our price range, but amazing cars, like the best, fastest cars that you can get on the market. Just dealing with those cars and really doing loads and loads of very exciting montages of those cars driving around uh, racetracks or different environments and things and just like very very high quality, very well edited and put together pieces where they show the car from different angles and um, whoever it is that's reviewing the car, if it's Jeremy Clarkson, he sits in the car and he, he gives his kind of review like this and it's kind of um, a little bit amusing as he goes. Uh, very well put together pieces. So it's a mixture of, of those reviews and then things like car news, which is basically where the three presenters sit there in the studio and they kind of talk about some recent events in the world of cars and then they make jokes about them and things like that. Um, and uh, then blokey banter, okay? Banter, that's like sort of light-hearted uh, conversation that might involve some joking around and maybe making fun of different things. Uh, that's banter. And it's like when guys get together, you know, we like to have a few beers and then we just sort of, you know, have a bit of banter. Um, it's that kind of, I guess it's that sort of slightly annoying um, uh, conversation that guys have when they're together that they think is really funny. Uh, they think it's brilliant and hilarious, but actually it's just really sort of pathetic. Uh, it's that sort of level. That's what banter is, really. But, you know, it's just lighthearted, fun conversation. And they do a lot of that kind of blokey banter um, on this show. And... Uh, then also there's the, the there are the bits where they go where they say and then we did this there there are those bits and those are essentially the ridiculous challenges in which they spend a lot of money and create some completely mad entertainment all 
around cars. So it's where they, you know, do some sort of big race across Europe where one of them's in a Ferrari and he goes from Italy to London and the other guys are like in a boat and a plane and they're all racing each other across Europe. Or they go to India and they sort of have to uh, take their their cars across the country and they sort of it upset the locals and get into trouble and you know that sort of thing you know mad stupid challenges like they have to build uh they have to build a car that's got a caravan stuck to the top of it but the problem is that all the cars are really small they're like smart cars with a caravan on top you know just totally dumb uh, challenges which are actually quite inventive and quite good fun i have to say um it's politically incorrect it's willfully irresponsible it's male centric it's unapologetically macho and competitive slightly offensive at times but altogether very well made television i must admit that i always watch it when it's on but i'm not completely convinced by the presenters and the general tone of it but some of the special episodes were amazingly well made the show is is popular but it's also controversial because it has been criticised for being sort of slightly racist or casually racist or making slightly off-colour jokes or inappropriate things. Uh, the makers of the show claim that, that they're not really supposed to be taken seriously. Uh, other people don't like it because it promotes irresponsible driving and it doesn't take into account any green issues. The main presenters, well, the three presenters are James May, who actually used to live in the building over the road from me in London. And I used to see James May in my local Tesco's supermarket. And also, I used to see him in the pub as well. Uh, the pub down the road from me, he used to drink in there. So he used to live over the road from me. And James May is basically a mischievous motoring journalist who, before doing Top Gear, had never done TV before. And he's kind of tall, scruffy, slow and sardonic and sarcastic. And they have a nickname for him. They call him Captain Slow. And to be honest, he's probably the one that you could stand having a drink in the pub with. I don't know if I could really handle having a drink in a pub with uh, Jeremy Clarkson. I don't know if he would annoy me or entertain me. I don't really know. Um, the same goes for Richard Hammond, especially the two of them together, because they sort of encourage each other, don't they? Whereas James May, I imagine I could sort of have a pint with him and he'd be all right. In fact, I kind of almost have had a pint with him because he used to drink in the pub uh, down the road from me. Um, so he seems like the nicer, milder one of the three, but you never know. I'd, I've no idea, really. I didn't actually meet him. Uh, then there's Richard Hammond, who comes from the same town as me. His hometown is Solly Hull in the West Midlands, which is uh, where I grew up as well. And uh, he's a former local DJ, radio DJ, who also never had done uh, TV work before joining Top Gear. And uh, Richard Hammond famously had a big accident during a high-speed dragster race on the show, and he was seriously injured, spending weeks in hospital recovering from head injuries. And they call him Richard the Hamster Hammond, even though he's definitely not a hamster, he's a man. Uh, but he looks a little bit like a hamster. To be honest, I think he looks more like a man than a hamster. But I guess because he's small and he's got sort of mousy features, uh, I guess, he looks a little bit like a hamster. But I'm not convinced. I think he's definitely a man. Jeremy Clarkson, who is probably the most famous presenter of Top Gear. He's tall. He's got curly hair. He's got a beer belly. He's got a voice that sounds like this. Um, Jeremy Clarkson lives nowhere near me. He's never lived anywhere near me. But he used to be a presenter in the early days of Top Gear, and he had done other TV work, like he'd done talk shows and some other programmes before being a part of the Top Gear reboot in 2002 with his old school friend, producer Andy Willman. Uh, Clarkson was fired from the BBC for allegedly punching a producer of the show when he was drunk and hungry. And this is what led to him leaving the show. I don't know the full details of what happened, but apparently Clarkson had been filming and he also had had a couple of drinks and he was waiting for food and waiting for catering to bring him some food. And he was he wanted like you know, a steak or something. And his producer said, this is here's the food. This is all I've got. And it was like cold food. And uh, apparently Clarkson went, I wanted hot food. And then he punched him. 
Um, and then the BBC fired him. He was fired from the BBC uh, for, for doing that because I guess the BBC thought, well, we can't exactly encourage or see to be supporting that kind of behaviour. That's totally, that's a completely unacceptable way to deal with someone in the workplace. So they kind of had to fire him. Um, and uh, then he left the show and so did James May and, and uh, Richard Hammond. They left as well. And um, the BBC found new presenters for Top Gear and they continued. They had uh, Chris Evans and uh, Joey from Friends on it as well. Uh, I don't think it was actually Joey himself. It was Matt LeBlanc, the uh, the actor. I don't think it was actually Joey. Like, how are you doing? You know, it wasn't him actually presenting it because he's not a real person, of course. No, it was uh, Matt LeBlanc. Uh, but basically it was Joey. It was basically Joey from Friends presenting it. But it didn't pick up the same audience figures or ratings, not nearly as popular or, or as successful as the other incarnation. And apparently the trio of May, Hammond and Clarkson is where the appeal of this show really is. And the three of them continue to make a big show about cars, which is now on Amazon Prime. And uh, that's called The Grand Tour, which as far as I can tell is pretty much the same as Top Gear, but with a, an even bigger budget. So you can actually see a lot of episodes of Top Gear on Netflix. A lot of it's there on Netflix and also quite a lot is on YouTube. So let's have a little look at the way that they speak on Top Gear. So this is how you can learn how to speak like a Top Gear presenter. Okay. So the first thing is pauses. There have to be fairly long pauses between little sections of what you're saying. So for example, this sentence, almost everything they say is absolutely full of pauses. Let's do that one. It, it would be like this. Almost everything they say is absolutely full of pauses. Okay. In fact, some of the pauses are so long, you don't realise that's not even the end of the sentence. Because this is the kind of sentence that has to end like this. So obviously, uh, this is a big word uh, in the world of Top Gear. Uh, in fact, this is the second point. So just using the word this, it seems like all the sentences that they say have to either begin or end with the word this. You know, for example, and then we did this. And this is this, you know? And this is the kind of car that my mum would drive, you know? So if there's one thing, one word which summarises everything that you need to know about Top Gear, it's this, okay? Um, intonation. So I talked about pausing, but intonation is important. That's the way that you, you might go up at some part of the sentence, and then you might start coming down, and then up a little bit more, before finally getting to the end where you say this. So intonation is important. And also hyperbole. Hyperbole is basically exaggeration, making something much bigger to create an effect. And it's, you know, journalists use it and certainly car reviewers use it. You heard Quentin Wilson doing it earlier on. That's that exaggeration. And there's plenty of hyperbole uh, in Top Gear these days as well. In, you get Jeremy Clarkson kind of going... I think it's quite possibly the best looking car in the world, which I think he said about five times on the show already about five different cars. You know, this is the most amazing feeling I've ever had with my trousers on. Uh, the level of talk is biblical. That kind of thing, just exaggerated kind of bullshit. It goes from naught to 60 in negative 12 seconds. It's so fast that it actually goes back to the future. If this car was a guitar player, it would be Eric Clapton, Jimi Hendrix and Noel Gallagher all rolled into one. And then, of course, the humour in the show, which some might call British humour. It's mainly kind of dry, sarcastic, opinionated hyperbole with loads of jokey banter and piss-taking. That's basically Top Gear. So let's have a listen to a little clip from Top Gear. And if you like, you can repeat what you hear Jeremy Clarkson saying in this review. If you want to learn how to speak like this, then, you know, you could just follow this review. And this is Jeremy Clarkson talking about the Porsche Carrera GT. The Porsche Carrera GT. So let's have a little listen to this. And uh, there's lots of language to be picked up from this as he talks about the car and describes the way it drives and stuff like that. And just look out for the level of uh, hyperbole in this review. 
This is the most exciting, the best looking, the most expensive and the fastest road going Porsche ever made. It's called the Carrera GT. And I'm going to start by looking at it from a German's point of view. I'm going to start by looking at it from a German's point of view. So it's a German car. It's the Porsche GT. He's now uh, sit. He's now lying on the ground under the car, looking up at the engine, and he's going to probably say lots of technical things because he's joking about looking at the car from a German point of view. So it's all going to be very, very minute technical things and slight sort of making slight piss taking of the Germans here. This is the sort of thing you get on uh, Top Gear. This is interesting. The crank is only 98.5 millimetres from the floor of the car. The reason why the crank is so low is because the clutch, which I have here, is so small. It's got two plates made from carbon fibre and uh, silicon carbide. Now, right, he does something really weird here, and I was watching this clip earlier on when I was sort of like just getting this episode ready, and there's this thing, I was going to cut it out, but I, I can't explain it. It's just like a really, I think it's just like a really bad joke. He's trying to be like Monty Python, and you know the way in Monty Python shows you get these random moments where the characters just sort of do weird things. Maybe he's trying to do that. I don't know, but I don't get this joke, so... Anyway, I'm going to keep it in, but this is where he's talking about some parts of the engine, and oh, oh, he can't say a particular word, and it makes him go like that. I don't understand it. So anyway, let's go. The reason why the crank is so low is because the clutch, which I have here, is so small. It's got two plates made from carbon fibre and uh, silicon carbide. He can't say silicon carbide. I don't know why it makes him go weird, but, you know... There you go. It's just British humour, I suppose. Sorry, that, that happens sometimes when I say silicon carbide. Ooh, uh, anyway, let's see how much it, uh, it weighs. Pop it in the scales that we have here. And we've got some sugar. Two so basically, he's establishing that the car is very light. I'm going to sort of fast forward a little bit here. He's still under the car. And what I have here is a cutaway of one of the, uh, one of the brakes. Also very light because it's made from silicon carbide. Carbide. What's that weird silicon carbide thing? What's all that about? Oh. 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 Okay, here we go. At this point, a German would come out of the lavatory, say everything's perfect, and move on. I don't really get that joke either. So at this point, a German would come out of the lavatory, say everything's perfect, and move on. So if we're talking about examining a car and making a decision about it. What's that German coming out of the toilet joke, Jeremy? Is he suggesting that, is this something like about the way that when Germans go to the loo and they do a number two in the loo, that the, the toilet in Germany is designed in such a way so that you can sort of examine the, uh, whatever you want to call it, you know, the, the thing that you've just created, you can examine it there before you flush it down the loo. I don't know. I don't... And maybe it's like some sort of reference to that, but what's he on about? Just stick to talking about cars, Jeremy, because that doesn't make sense. I'm sure that there must be something to it. Maybe I'm missing it. I don't know, but it doesn't make sense to me. At this point, a German would come out of the lavatory, say everything's perfect, and move on. But I'm not German. So let's look at it from a British point of view. That's him looking at it from a British point of view. <laughs> I am just a mass of goose pimples. I'm just a mass of goose pimples. Goose pimples, that's what happens when you get nervous and uh, your skin goes all pimply. Goose pimples. Um, there you go. All right. So goose bumps or goose pimples. That's like when you feel scared or excited. That's what your skin does. He says, I am just a mass of, of uh, goose pimples. I am just a mass of goose pimples. I've never had a feeling like this before. I've never felt anything like that. It really? You've never felt anything like that before? All the different cars that you've driven, you've never felt anything like that? 
I think you've probably had some fairly similar experiences of driving around that track in different cars, but apparently no, he's never felt anything like that. Listen to that engine! It's a 5.7 litre V10. Originally designed for racing, but now it's in a road car and the effect is absolutely mind-blowing. I can't imagine someone actually driving this car on the streets. You know, this uh, sort of uh, sports car being driven like that on the streets. I mean, you can't, you could never actually drive it like that. It's just mental. The performance figures really are biblical. You get 612 brake horsepower, and that means 0 to 60 in 3.9 seconds. Flat out, you'll be doing 205. Flat out, that means when you're driving at top speed. If you're going flat out, that means at top speed. Even in the fastest, most exotic cars, there's a point where the power starts to lose its battle with the friction of the air. But in this, there's no let up at all. He's talking about when a car reaches a certain speed, there's a sense that the, the pressure of the air gets a bit too much for the engine but he's saying that you don't get that at all with this car. It's like it's moving in a vacuum. 120, 130, 140. 100. It's like it's moving in a vacuum, as if there's no sort of air, air pressure at all. It's like it's moving in a vacuum. It just isn't going to stop. Not only is it one of the fastest and most exciting cars I've ever driven, it is also... One of the most beautiful. Not only is it blah, 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 it is also. Uh, that's a really great, uh, nice phrase. Not only is it one of the fastest cars I've ever driven, it's also one of the most beautiful. Not only is it. You notice the, um, the inversion there. Not only is it. You need to invert the verb and the subject. So not only is it. Not, yeah. Not only is it uh, one of the fastest cars I've ever driven, it's also one of the most beautiful. Right. Not only is it one of the fastest and most exciting cars I've ever driven, it is also one of the most beautiful. It isn't styled with the verve or the passion of a Ferrari or a Lamborghini. It's, it's form following function and every piece, every detail is as precise and as perfect as Germany's rail timetable. Okay, just a couple of bits of uh, vocabulary to uh, point out there. He said, uh, it isn't styled with the verve or the passion of a Ferrari. So styled, meaning sort of designed, um, it isn't styled with the verve or passion of a Ferrari. We know what passion is, but verve is basically lively and forceful enthusiasm. You know, like the way that a Ferrari or a Lamborghini uh, is designed, it's designed with this kind of passion and this lively, forceful enthusiasm or verve. So he says it isn't styled with the verb verve. Verve is spelled V E R V E, the verve or the passion of a Ferrari. Um, and he says it's form following function. Form following function. This means that function comes first before form. So usually in design and stuff, we talk about form and function. Uh, form is basically the way it looks, um, and function is the way that it works. And so apparently it's form following function, meaning that the most important things are the ways in which it works, and the way it looks is secondary to that. So it's form following function. Not only is it one of the fastest and most exciting cars I've ever driven, it is also... One of the most beautiful. It isn't styled with the verve or the passion of a Ferrari or a Lamborghini. It's, it's form following function and every piece, every detail is as precise and as perfect as Germany's rail timetable. Really, there's only one car this can be compared with. The McLaren Mercedes SLR we tested two weeks ago. 
They both cost more than £300,000 and they both produce more than 600 brake horsepower. Brake horsepower is uh, basically the power of an engine uh, measured in horses. Over 600 brake horsepower, I guess, means that this car is as powerful as about 600 horses. It's called brake horsepower because um, this is the uh, degree of resistance. So that the power is measured by the degree of resistance offered by a brake. So they use the power of the engine and then they apply that, apply the brake to it. The brake obviously is what stops the engine or slows it down. So they get the engine going and then uh, apply a brake to it. And the amount of resistance... Um, the uh, yeah the degree of resistance offered uh, by a brake represents the useful power that that machine can develop. So essentially, brake horsepower is just a, a measurement of power uh, of the of the engine. But there is a crucial difference. The Mercedes, that's a GT car. It's got a big boot, it's got thick carpet, it's got lots of luxury equipment. This though, much more focused. Carbon fibre here, a magnesium transmission tunnel, a simple beechwood gear lever. This is a supercar unplugged. As a result, it's much lighter than the McLaren, and that makes it nimbler and edgier. N it makes it nimbler and edgier. Nimble, that's a nice word. N-I-M-B-L-E. And if someone is nimble or something is uh, is nimble, it means it sort of moves in a very uh, quick and light way. Like, I guess, a cat. You could describe a cat as being nimble. If you've ever seen a cat, like, sort of climbing along a wall or something, they're very quick and they're very light. So light on your feet, nimble. You could say a gymnast is nimble as well, kind of light on their feet. They could probably jump up and sort of keep their balance very, very well. So the car is nimble, which I guess suggests that it's light, and yet it moves kind of quickly on its, on its feet, and it's stable um, and quick. And that makes it nimbler and edgier, and that makes it more of a handful. If something is a handful, it means it's difficult to control. So obviously you can say that a car is a handful. Oh, it's a bit of a handful, isn't it, this car? But you can also say that probably people are a handful. Cool. Your kids are a bit of a handful, aren't they? for example. So if your kids are a bit of a handful, it means that it's kind of difficult to keep them under control. God, your son's a bit of a handful, isn't he? Yeah. Uh, right. As a result, it's much lighter than the McLaren, and that makes it nimbler and edgier, and that makes it more of a handful. Whoa, 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 whoa. So the car is like spinning out. Uh, and I'm going to get to the bit where he talks about um, uh, racing it around the track. Normally, I like British and Italian cars because they have so much soul and character. German cars are always find are long on engineering but a bit short on passion. This, though... My God. This, though... My God. So he's saying that... Um, he prefers British and Italian cars because of the character. He sometimes finds German cars to uh, have less of a, less passion. Uh, this, though, my God. So actually, he thinks this is an exception. So just the word though is used at the end sometimes of um, things you say uh, as, a, as a way of saying but, you know. So normally you put but at the beginning, but you can put though at the end and it just has the same function. OK, so it's a bit like saying, you know, I normally think German cars sort of lack uh, passion, but this, uh, my God, or uh, this, though, my God, you see. This, though, my God, it's that good, really. It is a phenomenon. Really? Uh, honestly, mind blowingly good. Okay, let's skip forward to when the car does the lap then. And apparently the car is really, really difficult to control. But uh, we're going to hear it now. And this is the Stig uh, doing a lap in the Porsche. And let's listen to the way that Jeremy describes um, what happens. So he gives like a really quick commentary of every single move that the car is making on this lap around the, the, the track. So listen really carefully to some of the language that, that Jeremy uses here. He had another go after that, spun it again and again and again. But then after a whole morning's practicing, he was ready to take on the Mercedes. 
<laughs> OK, this is the big one. Masses of wheel spin off the line, down to the first corner. He has got to tread carefully. He knows that that big V10 landmine will bite. I am actually surprised he's playing his power ballads today because really he has... Look at that through Chicago. He's gently on the power, doesn't want to lose it. He really doesn't want to lose it. Bit of a wiggle, he's OK, coming up to the hammerhead. This is where he spun it before. Cannot afford a mistake now. He's already off the SLR's pace at this point, but now... This is maximum attack mode. He's really opening the taps now, really, really working that manual gearbox, ringing out every millisecond advantage over the automatic McLaren. This is the second to last bend, hard on the ceramic brakes, keep it steady, he's measuring out the power. Gambon corner, Ooh, he's pushing it now, and there he is! Wow, lots and lots of descriptive language there. Let's go through some of that stuff that you just heard uh, Jeremy describing. We'll go through it now uh, bit by bit. So you heard him say he was ready to take on the Mercedes. Talking about the driver, the Stig, saying that the Stig, after doing his practice, he was ready to take on the Mercedes. Take on here is a phrasal verb, which means uh, to fight against someone or to, to compete with someone especially when they are bigger or more powerful than you are. For example, Democrats were reluctant to take on a president whose popularity ratings were historically high, for example. And in this case, the Stig was ready to take on the Mercedes, meaning to try to beat the uh, lap time of the Mercedes SLR. SLR? I think it's the SLR. Because SLR is a camera. Anyway, so he was ready to take on the Mercedes. Uh, next one was uh, masses of wheel spin off the line. Wheel spin is, you know, when a car starts really quickly and the, the, the wheels spin round and, and smoke comes off the tyres. That's wheel spin. Masses of wheel spin. Masses of something means a lot of something. In this case, masses of wheel spin. Masses of wheel spin off the line. And he said he has to, he's got to tread carefully here, to tread carefully. Tread carefully basically means to be careful while you're moving. Uh, to tread is actually with your feet. You tread, that means the way your feet uh, touch down on the ground. You've got to tread carefully. Uh, if you're walking across ice, you have to tread very carefully. Tread is like a synonym of, of step. OK, and in this case, he said he's got to tread carefully, which just means he's got to be careful the way he deals with those corners, because the uh, the Porsche is known for spinning out very easily to spin out. Uh, you heard some music in the car, and this is because the Stig usually listens to music while he's doing his laps. And Clarkson said, I'm surprised he's playing his power ballads today. A power ballad is a type of song. Uh, a power ballad is usually like a sort of really passionate love song. Uh, and a power ballad would be one with like, you know, really big production. And you can hear that Stig is listening to some power ballads today. Uh, then he said, bit of a wiggle, but he's OK coming up to the hammerhead. A wiggle, that's when um, you could say like a person might wiggle. Um, let's see, how would I describe wiggle? Um, wiggle is a bit like if you move your bum from side to side, that's wiggling. And similarly, if a um, if a car, as it comes out of a corner really quickly, it might wiggle. Like the back end of the car might just move left and right a little bit. So it's just when it the back end moves left and right a little bit a few times. That's a wiggle. Um, you might wiggle if you are trying to get comfortable in a seat. You kind of wiggle into the seat, you know. Right, so that's a wiggle. He said a bit of a wiggle, but he's okay coming up to the hammerhead. The hammerhead is one of the corners on the Top Gear track. They've got hammerhead, they've got Chicago, and they've got another one called Gambon Corner. Um, and he said, this is where he spun it before. Can't afford a mistake now. Um, uh, spin, spun. Spun being the past of spin. And he said, this is where he spun it before, meaning this is where the car spun out before. Can't afford a mistake now. This is maximum attack mode, which I think you understand. Uh, maximum attack mode. So uh, he's gone for the full-on attack method. Uh, he's a really aggressive driving, really trying to beat the Mercedes. He's really opening the taps now. I guess this means that he's putting his foot down. He's accelerating really hard taps you know taps you get um 
in the bathroom, if you want water, you have to turn on the taps. But I suppose this is just like an expression which means he's opening up the engine. He's really opening the taps now. Really working that manual gearbox. To work the gearbox, I guess, just means to use it, you know? Uh, just to use it in a... Like, use it in a quite hard or tough way to work the gearbox. In this case, the manual gearbox. Ringing out any millisecond advantage. If you ring something out, that's W-R-I-N-G to ring something out. Normally, it would be if you've washed some fabrics or washed some clothes. You need to squeeze those clothes. You twist them and squeeze them as much as possible so that every last drop of um, water comes out. So that's wringing your clothes, meaning squeezing them and twisting them until all the water comes out. And essentially, it's like wringing something out. It's like pushing it to the, to the fullest to get absolutely every last drop out of it. In this case, wringing out any millisecond advantage, just meaning pushing it to the limit to get every single little millisecond of advantage in time. And he said then, this is the second to last bend. So you've got the last bend and then the Penultimate bend is also, you could say, the second to last bend. Bend, of course, meaning corner. This is the second to last bend. Uh, so the last bend, the second to last bend, the third uh, to last bend. Uh, hard on the ceramic brakes. Um, so uh, the brakes I've mentioned before, these are the, the, usually it's controlled by a pedal. You put your foot on the brakes and it slows down the car. Uh, this one apparently has ceramic brakes. Ceramic is that kind of material which uh, is like very hard and um, uh, doesn't heat up as much as, as metal, I suppose. And uh, keep it steady, meaning um, don't, don't uh, lose control. Keep it steady. He's measuring out the power, which means kind of um, applying the accelerator carefully to make sure that he doesn't put too much power or not not uh, too little power, but just the right amount of power. So he's measuring out the power. And then on Gambon Corner, uh, Clarkson said, oh, he's pushing it now, which means he's, you know, applying pressure. And there he is. He was ready to take on the Mercedes. <laughs> Okay, this is the big one. Masses of wheel spin off the line, down to the first corner. He has got to tread carefully. He knows that that big V10 landmine will bite. I am actually surprised he's playing his power ballads today because really he has... Look at that through Chicago. He's gently on the power, doesn't want to lose it. He really doesn't want to lose it. Bit of a wiggle, he's okay coming up to the hammerhead. This is where he spun it before. Cannot afford a mistake now. He's already off the SLR's pace at this point, but now this is maximum attack mode. He's really opening the taps now, really, really working that manual gearbox, ringing out every millisecond advantage over the automatic McLaren. This is the second to last bend, hard on the ceramic brakes. Keep it steady, he's measuring out the power. Gambon corner, Ooh, he's pushing it now, and there he is. Okay, the McLaren Mercedes did it 120.9. Yes. We know that. Go on. Which is pretty fast it's compared amazing. to all the others. Yes. Yes. And Porsche. Yes. Got it here. 119.9. So, fastest car we've ever had. Fastest car. All right. So there you go. That's a clip of the Porsche Carrera GT car review and lap. Uh, you can find that video on the page for this episode. It's on YouTube. All right, so that's an example of uh, the way that they kind of talk about cars and the way they give reviews of cars these days. Um, let's let's look at the, the kind of way that they do banter. I was talking about that before. That's that kind of lighthearted, humorous, slightly sort of... Uh, piss takey sort of conversations that, that guys have. And we're going to uh, listen to an example of their banter here. And this is them talking about cows or cars. Um, cows or cars. So kind of dealing with the, kind of dealing with the environment a little bit uh, and dealing with the question of cows or cars. And before we listen to that, let me just sort of pre-teach some bits of language you might hear. So you might hear someone saying, can anyone see a flaw in my plan? So you know what a plan is. What's a flaw in someone's plan? It means uh, like a, a fault or a problem or a weak point. So that's a flaw. Uh, F-L-A-W. Uh, can anyone see a flaw in my plan? So you've put a plan together and you want to see if uh, other people have spotted any weaknesses. So can you see a flaw in my plan? Any imperfections? Next one is, we'll be out of a job. 
if you're if you are out of a job, it means that you are unemployed. You don't have a job. So we'll be out of a job. And uh, then the word steer, and um, there's a kind of a joke made with the word steer. Um, so a steer is a kind of cow. It's a bull that's been sort of neutered. A bull that's kind of, I guess, uh, had its genitals removed, you know? Um, the I don't know, the sorts of things that farmers do. But um, a, 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 a steer is a, a kind of cow. And someone makes the joke of top steer, uh, talking about cows or cars. And then um, Jeremy, I think, says, the only drawback I can see are cattle grids. Cattle grids are those things that farmers use uh, to prevent their cows from escaping from fields uh, when a car needs to go through. So you get these kind of things that cars drive over them, but cows can't walk over them. And they're kind of like a metal grill in the ground. Um, and there are these holes in the ground and the the horses, not horses, the uh, cattle can't walk through them. Uh, so they, they're scared to walk through them. So those are cattle grids. And he's saying the only drawback I can see are cattle grids. So let's listen to them talking about cows or cars. And this is the sort of jokey banter that you get on Top Gear. Hey, now, eminent scientists have been busy at work. And they've announced this week that a cow produces 500 litres of methane every day. Just because you've come dressed as a farmer, I don't see why you're... (laughs) Bear with me on this, because I've been doing some maths. (laughs) What? Methane is 23 times more powerful than carbon dioxide, okay, as a global warming agent, yeah? So that means a cow does more global warming than a Range Rover. <laughs> Honestly, a Range Rover 10,000 miles a year produces less in a day than a cow farting. <laughs> so something's got to give. Yeah. Cows or cars? Yeah. Got to be cows. Uh, no, I think we get rid of the cows and we keep the cars. No, we've got to get rid of the cars. No, we get rid of the no, cats. No, I'm not get, No, look, milk, I can't do without that. Shoes. You get cheese, Burgers. Eggs. Yes. Not eggs, no, James. You live in... <laughs> There's a man who lives in Hammersmith. <laughs> no, no, you're wrong. Eggs come from the milkman. Yeah, but yes, the milkman right. doesn't lay them. <laughs> anyway, forget all of that. The thing is... If you get rid of cars, how are you going to get to work? You can't get to work on a cow. You can ride a cow. You can't ride a cow! You You can ride a cow. Can anyone see a flaw in my plan? I can. What? We'll be out of a job. We won't. We just call it Top Steer. (laughs) And we'll have a power board and we'll have all the different cows and how fast they can get around our track. The only drawback I can see are cattle grids. Well, (laughs) cattle grids are a problem and also if it's about to rain, they'll all lie down. Other than that... God, imagine that. The M1 just lined with people all yeah, on their cats waiting for it to brighten up before they can continue their What gym. can you do? Wait you till see- the police cow comes along. <laughs> I think you're talking nonsense and you've gone a little bit I mad. I think you're... Both- I've no idea what you two have been talking about. <laughs> so that was a uh, cow or car. I think you got it. I mean, I hope so. You can Again, you can see that clip on the page for this episode too. Um, right, what about the challenges that they do? Uh, the challenges are quite fun. And uh, so I was talking before about these sort of crazy things that they they do, like these races in different vehicles and things. Uh, one of my favourite challenges was the one with the Reliant Robin, which they tried to send into space. So a Reliant Robin is a kind of a joke vehicle here. I mean, it's a real vehicle. You used to see them around quite a lot. Uh, but they've become a bit of a joke because people always make fun of them. And basically, Reliant Robins are three-wheeled cars. Like these kind of crappy three-wheeled cars. I think they were sort of cheaper than normal cars because they were in a like a different tax band or something. But they were just like these really cheapo cars. And you did see quite a lot of people with them. But they're a bit of a joke, basically. And in this one, what they wanted to do was um, send a car into space on a rocket. And they chose the Reliant Robin because they thought it would be more aerodynamic. And um, so that was the mission. Can we send... Um, a, a Reliant Robin into the atmosphere on a rocket, which is extraordinary, really. And they actually tried to do it. And I think Jeremy Clarkson said that James and Richard would never be able to do it. It was one of those things, you know, it started off as like a sort of bit of studio conversation. And uh, they said, oh, I bet we could make a, 
uh, Robin Reliant Robin into a spaceship and Jeremy Clarkson was like you're never going to do it so it became a challenge and then uh, they set about doing it and essentially they kind of met up with a bunch of um, I guess engineers in in Manchester and they constructed this thing and they put it together uh, along with a, a, a guy who used to fly model airplanes you know those remote control airplanes that you can fly around well they got him to pilot the um, the space shuttle rocket thing um, as a remote control vehicle. So no one was actually on it. So the, they had the whole thing set up. What I'm going to play to you now is um, just a little bit about when uh, James and Richard go to see the engineers and describe the mission that they want to achieve. And they talk about some of the technical details. So here are some of those kind of technical bits and pieces relating to the Reliant Robin challenge. So I just need to get to the right point. Here we go. All right. Right, gentlemen, what we want from you is the most difficult type of space rocket, a space shuttle. This has to work properly. It has to have the big fuel tank. It has to have the booster rockets. They all have to separate. And most importantly, we have to be able to bring it back down under control to a landing. And it's worth saying as well that nobody's going to go in this, Yeah. but it has to be landed. Yeah. The idea of this is that we will send it up to a few thousand feet, what we're doing is testing the principle. If you can make all this work and we can bring it into this controlled landing, we will probably get funding from the EU for a proper space mission. So you want to launch it, jettison the SRBs. Jettison the SRBs. Jettison the orbiter. And fly it down. What's the orbiter? The Reliant. Right. So you want to launch it, you want to jettison the, what was it? Jettison the what? SRVs? Something like that? To a few thousand feet, what we're doing is testing the principle. If you can make all this work and we can bring it into this controlled landing, we will probably get funding from the EU for a proper space mission. So you want to launch it? Jettison the SRBs. Jettison the SRBs. So SRBs, I guess, are the two big fuel rockets on the side of the main rocket, uh, which are going to fly this thing into the air. So I suppose those are the SRBs. When they're empty, they'll be jettisoned, which means that they get sort of thrown away. Uh, they get uh, sort of blown off the sides of the spaceship, and it falls. They fall down to the to the ground. So they get jettisoned. Jettison the you know, launch it. Jettison the SRBs. Jettison the SRBs. Jettison the orbiter and fly it down. What? Jettison the orbiter. That's the um, Reliant Robin space shuttle. It's going to be jettisoned from the main rocket and then it can f be flown down. What's the orbiter? The Reliant. Right. Have you got a spare billion dollars? Though? No. You see, that's why we've come to you. Have you got a spare billion dollars, though? He says in his Manchester accent. Right. Have you got a spare billion dollars? No, you see, that's why we've come to you. Because you're from Manchester and you'll be able to do it for ten and six. And there'll be as much tea as you can drink while yep. you're doing it. Chips Absolutely. in lard, everything. Anything you want. It is difficult in every single way. So can you imagine uh, trying to launch a uh, Reliant Robin, a three-wheel car, into the atmosphere on a rocket? Can you imagine what's involved in that just the pure engineering of like setting the thing up and pointing it in the right direction and filling it with enough fuel and making sure that uh uh it, the the ratio is right the fuel to weight ratio and that um you kind of you know how to make it jettison those different rockets and things and making sure that the remote control system works um it's uh it's a nightmare isn't it and especially the reliant robin it's not really that aerodynamic so it must be difficult to make it fly. Right. You've got a Reliant Robin. It's a car, so it's really, really heavy. Yeah. So rough numbers, we're, we're going to need about 12 times the amount of power that the Mini had. Really? It's the largest non-commercial rocket launched in Europe. It's the most powerful non-commercial rocket launched in Europe. Right. As a rocket, it's the most awful shape it could ever be. But I thought the Robin was a good place to start because it's pointy at one end. That's as far as I've got with that. It's pointy. Shut Yeah. All right then, so Richard Hammond thought it would be good to use the, the Reliant because it's pointy at one end. Uh, which is not much of a, it's not really much of a scientific explanation for it. So um, they actually built the thing with all the rockets and everything like that. They built it. They found this guy to to fly it with his remote control thing, and then they get to this site. I don't know where it is. Somewhere out in the in the countryside in England, and um, they try to test it. And I'm just trying to get us to the right point here. 
where um, we can hear what happens. So obviously you can't see this, uh, but I'm going to play you what happens. Actually, there's a little conversation between the two of them where they're talking about it. They're lying sort of in bunk beds uh, the night before thinking about the mission and whether they can actually get the thing into the air or not. I mean, it's it's uh, uh, ridiculous, really. But um, uh, can they actually make it fly? Reliant orbiter. Wow. Hammond? What? What do you think the chances are of it actually working? What do you think the chances are of it actually working? What are the chances? Meaning, you know, what's the possibility of it or likelihood of it working? What do you? Th- what are the chances? What does he say? What do you think the chances are? Usable, reliant orbiter. What do you think the chances are of us doing it? Wow. Hammond? What? What do you think the chances are of it actually working? It'll work. It's just that, you know, when we do these big things, they usually end in some sort of massive disaster. When we do these big things, they usually end in some sort of massive disaster. I'd quite like this one to work. 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 Okay. (laughs) All right. So here we are the next day, and what's going to happen? The now, tension now was almost unbearable. You could almost hear Jeremy preparing some intergalactic smugness. We could, you could hear Jeremy uh, preparing some intergalactic smugness. I told you what smug means in a recent episode. That's where you're sort of self-satisfied, pleased with yourself. Uh, so maybe they're, they're thinking that Jeremy Clarkson was going to prepare some high level of smugness when this thing doesn't work. So everyone's getting all stressed out and tense. Just a few seconds before the uh, launch. So would it stay on course during the ascent? Would the rockets and fuel tank detach? And would Steve, who by the way had refused our kind offer of a bunker, be able to pilot the Robin down safely? In just a few seconds, we'd know. Now, you know what? I'm just going to play you the audio. Now, if you haven't seen this, you don't know what's going to happen, but I'm just going to play you the audio. There's not a lot of talking as as it happens. You hear some sound effects, you hear some reactions and stuff like that. So I want you to try and guess what has happened. So remember, the thing has to be launched into the air. The two side rockets need to be jettisoned. Then the... the uh, f- the Reliant Robin has to detach from the main uh, big rocket and then it has to be flown in and landed, okay? So listen, and what do you think's happening? You're going to find out, but what do you think is happening based on the sound effects? Here we go. Unbelievable. So the thing uh, took off. It was amazing. This Reliant Robin rocket take actually took off and it flew really high into the air and it was amazing. And then the side rockets detached and it was it was working and it looked incredible. And then when it came for the um, 
the the Reliant Robin to detach from the other rocket. It didn't happen. And the thing just curved over in the air and started pointing straight down. And the whole thing with the car on top just flew straight down and just exploded in this massive explosion on the ground. And everyone was totally shocked and uh, devastated. Obviously, no one was hurt. uh, But the whole thing was a huge failure. So there you go. That's an example of just one of the challenges. Um, and generally, that's been a taste of, of Top Gear. But um, So I said before that it is a very popular show, but it's not popular with everyone. And in fact, it has received quite a lot of um, um, criticism over the years. Now, the bits that I played there were, I guess, fairly sort of harmless bits. But uh, Top Gear has had lots and lots of different controversies over the years. And in fact, there's a whole Wikipedia page devoted to it. And they there are... Uh, sort of cultural mockery seemed to be the one that they were most criticised for. There were some accusations of homophobia um, and cultural mockery of the Germans, the Romanians, the Mexicans and Argentina and others, uh, I remember, and specific criticisms throughout every single series of, um, of the show. So, you know, it's fairly sort of politically incorrect and mildly shocking at times. And it's picked up various different uh, types of criticism. It's criticised for being excessive, for being decadent and extremely materialistic, this whole sort of worship of these material items. Uh, Casual misogyny, so sort of a male-centric, slightly um, uh, maybe sexist sort of slant on things. A bit of casual racism, that kind of cultural mockery that we had before. Um, issues around climate change, which is obviously a huge problem in the world, uh, the general irresponsibility of it, and also just setting a bad example, like driving the cars so fast in such a dangerous manner, and just generally encouraging that as the kind of uh, the thing that you're looking for in, in cars. So it's been criticised for those things. Stuart Lee, the comedian, uh, had a go on stage at Jeremy Clarkson saying he's outrageous and politically incorrect, and he does it all just for the money. That those attitudes, those slightly politically incorrect attitudes are not even genuine. He's just doing them because he can sell more um, you know, stories in the Sun newspaper and more books and it's just good for his career. So you know, Clarkson is maybe accused of being of presenting himself as like this kind of counterculture figure or something, whereas in fact he totally exists within the kind of um, establishment essentially. That he's kind of he's friends with David Cameron and various other people. He's part of like the Chipping Norton set, um, and so you know he's not quite as edgy and and uh, counterculture as he l- likes to seem. Um, those are just some criticisms. Steve Coogan, um, the comedian and actor from the UK, criticised um, uh, Top Gear for being basically based on offensive comments and it's not really making enough effort and it's not punching up because the idea with really with comedy is that it, it's at its best when it's criticising or poking satirical fun um, at people in a higher position of power you know, so high, lower status people uh, criticising the status quo. And that the view is that in the UK, the best form of humour, the sort of most intelligent and worthwhile form of humour is one that's questioning what's going on and also questioning the general power structure and, and what they call punching up. Uh, whereas, um, you know, Top Gear at times looks like it's punching down, like making fun at sort of people at a lower level, you know. Um, and uh, there's there was a story about it, I think, on Channel 4. Channel 4 News ran a story about it. So let's listen to uh, their story about Steve Coogan attacking Top Gear over their casual uh, racism. And this is another video you can get on YouTube. Now, the presenters of Top Gear have come under fire again, this time from the comedian Steve Coogan, a frequent guest on their show for their anti-Mexican jokes on last week's edition of the programme. In a strongly worded article in the Observer newspaper, Coogan says the comments by Jeremy Clarkson, Richard Hammond and James May were misjudged and about as funny as a cold sweat followed by shooting pains down the left arm. 
They were misjudged and about as funny as a cold sweat followed by shooting pains running down the left arm, which is not very funny at all. A cold sweat is, you know, that's when you sweat, but you're cold. It's often a sign of being ill. And a shooting pain down your left arm is said to be a um, symptom of a, of a heart attack or something. A shooting pain running down your left arm. So Steve Coogan uh, saying that the show, uh, what was it? That the show was not funny. In fact, it was about as funny as, you know, having a heart attack. So not very funny at all. Um, and they're referring to the fact that... Um, uh, you know, one of those um, controversial moments in Top Gear when one of the presenters uh, was talking about Mexican people and he made these sort of off-colour remarks about Mexicans, essentially saying that they're lazy um, and that they don't do any work uh, and that they stay in bed. You know, like really, really lazy stereotypes, like not particularly clever or particularly well thought through, just a very lazy st- stereotype. Uh, and that's what um, Steve Coogan criticised them for. Coogan was responding after the Mexican ambassador to the UK made a complaint to the BBC. Here's James Blake. Why Sorry. would you want a Mexican car? It started as a chat about a sports car, but it prompted the Mexican ambassador to complain of outrageous, vulgar and inexcusable insults. Mexican car is just going to be a lazy, feckless, flatulent open. <laughs> Leaning against a fence asleep, looking at a cactus with a blanket with a hole in the middle on as a coat. I wouldn't feel upset if someone gave... But now a former guest on the show, the comedian Steve Coogan, who often attracts controversy himself, has launched an attack on the Top Gear presenters. Writing in The Observer, he says, with Top Gear, it is three rich middle-aged men laughing at poor Mexicans and said their comedy was lazy, feckless and flatulent. So lazy, feckless and flatulent is what Richard Hammond said about Mexican people, that they're lazy, feckless and flatulent. Or he said that, you know, you wouldn't want a, you wouldn't want a Mexican car because it would be lazy, feckless and flatulent. Lazy, you know, feckless um, essentially means sort of um, lacking strength of character, lacking initiative or strength of character. So kind of weak, weakness. Uh, so it was lazy, feckless, meaning kind of weak and uh, with no backbone. And flatulent, flatulent means that you fart a lot. So if you eat lots of beans, you might become flatulent. So Coogan said that Top Gear was lazy, feckless and flatulent because they said that Mexican people were lazy, flex- feckless and flatulent. Uh, all right. <laughs> they can't do food, the Mexicans, can they? Because it's all like sick with cheese on it. <laughs> they can't do food, the Mexicans, because it's all like sick with cheese on it. Now, you know, again, it's just not very, well, it's not really very clever stuff. It's pretty lazy and it's a bit offensive. It's like, basically, they're trying to make the show funny, but a lot of the stuff is just pretty lazy, old-fashioned humour. And today, other comedians have waded into the mire. We should look at whether they've done good comedy or bad comedy, whether it's dangerous comedy, as in dangerous that it supports prejudice, or whether it's dangerous comedy, as in challenges prejudice. Um, And the best comedy is comedy that makes us question. If you look at Partridge or David Brent, um, what they're doing is similar jokes. You can imagine David Brent doing the Mexican jokes, but at the same time, there's a framework where they're saying, are you right to laugh at this? And with the Top Gear people, there seems to be no framework. There seems to be just a casual, blokey, let's laugh at it. And I think that's what's lazy about it. Just imagine waking up and remembering you're Mexican. (laughs) That'd be brilliant. Just imagine waking up and remembering that you're Mexican. I'm not surprised the Mexican ambassador complained uh, complained to the BBC about that. It'd be brilliant because you, you could just go straight back to sleep again. The worst part of it was when he said, imagine waking up in the morning and being Mexican. I thought, wow, you know, if you replace that with various other words like Pal- Palestinian or Israeli, you know, people would be losing their minds. And I think we've taken a bit of an attitude that because it's Mexicans, it's far enough away or not in the news or not topical, that actually it doesn't really matter. So this growing backlash against the Top Gear presenters hasn't come from the area you might expect, not the Equalities Commission, but other comedians. This is the kind of guy who speaks like this on a news show. So the rising backlash against the... 
I don't know what he said at the end there, but it's this is he's a news guy, and this is the way that they speak on the on the news. I'm wearing a suit, but I'm not wearing a tie. I've got a brown watch strap, and I've got glasses, and this is the way that I speak. Come from the area, you might expect not the Equalities Commission, but other comedians. The Quality and Human Rights Commission said it won't take a stand because it won't police schoolboy humour. You're not not bothered about what he said particularly? I am bothered about what he says because I think it's juvenile, it's vulgar, it's, you know, it's unacceptable. But that's for broadcasters and columnists to argue about. It's not for the law. We need to deal with more serious things. Jeremy Clarkson has made an apology of sorts in his column in The Sun, but then accused the Mexicans of being humourless. His apology in his in his article in The Sun was this. He said, I'm truly sorry that you have no sense of humour. So it's not really an apology. On his website, Richard Hammond writes, If we really have upset anyone, if they really feel I was expressing a genuinely held view that I believe Mexico to be populated by blokes in big hats and moustaches, then I am very sorry. So obviously, you know, he, they didn't mean it. Or they didn't... I don't think they really meant to suggest that uh, all Mexicans were lazy. Or did they? I don't know. I don't think that's really the main thing they were trying to do. They were just trying to be funny. And they just went for the laziest sort of target that they could find. Um, and so that's the that's where the criticism comes from. Sort of lazy journalism or lazy comedy. The BBC has also apologised to the Mexican ambassador, saying the comments were mischievous, but with no vindictiveness behind them. There you go, mischievous, but with no vindictiveness. That's what I was trying to say, that uh, they didn't really intend to cause offence. They were just being mischievous, you know, trying to f- make cheeky jokes. OK, well, there you go. That's basically Top Gear for you. What do you think of all of that? I remember when Top Gear was on TV in the olden days, uh, it had a really cool TV theme because a lot of our uh, TV shows um, used to have really cool TV themes that were made by, like, I guess it was like some sort of house band at the BBC that did all the TV show mu- music, and it was brilliant. I'm trying to find it right now. Two, we take a look at the world of motoring as we move into Top Gear. <laughs> So that was the Top Gear theme in in the eighties that I remember. But there were some really good other um, TV themes that uh, we're going to have to have a look at. So there's the snooker music, and the, the music from the snooker was brilliant. Oh yeah, it's so good. It's I love this theme tune so much. This is from BBC Snooker. was the uh, for the music from um, the snooker which is pretty good i'm trying to find the formula one music now oh this is it i think they used this on the uh, guardians of the galaxy 2 tra- Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I've got to do one more, and that's uh, Ski Sunday. 
uh, because Ski Sunday had a brilliant one. So we've had Saturday's music. Um, let's have a little listen to the Ski Sunday theme tune if we can find it. Doesn't it feel like you're skiing when you listen to this? Honestly, the, the music from the 70s is just the best. Even cheesy stuff like this, it just sounds so good with that kind of old uh, analogue recording sound and the instruments they're using. Okay, you know what? Just before we end this episode, so we've talked about Top Gear. Well, I have anyway. Um, I hope you liked all of that. Uh, leave your Top Gear comments in the comments section and all that stuff. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it and you've learned a few bits of language from it and all that stuff. I just started playing some old TV themes there from uh, like sports shows that we had on TV that were brilliant. And I just found this one. This is Bill Bailey, who is a brilliant uh, comedian. And this was him on a BBC show called The One Show, talking about TV themes. And Bill Bailey's so clever that he, he plays all these instruments and he's a multi-instrumentalist and uh, really brilliant musician. And he uses his musical skills in his comedy by sort of parodying studying different, um, different bits of music. And in this one, he's talking about TV themes. I think he does the Ski Sunday music. I, do, I love theme tunes. I mean, uh, uh, the thing that you see there is how versatile theme tunes can be. And one of my favourites is uh, the Match of the Day. Uh, you know, the theme tune. OK, so we've got Match of the Day. I'm going to need to find, find you Match of the Day now because um, uh, otherwise um, it's not going to make sense. So let's have a little listen to Match of the Day. Do you know Match of the Day? Um, it's like a classic show from um, for many many years it's been on the TV uh, let's have a little listen to the match of the day theme that is the sound of Saturday evening in Britain basically and every every kid of my generation whoever gets a whoever sort of whenever they got a ball at their feet and started kicking a ball around you'd get the match of the day theme in your head dun, 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 dun. there was always the it's like the football music basically <laughs> Okay, so you get the idea. So now Bill Bailey's going to talk about the, BB, the BBC Match of the Day music. ...tunes can be. And one of my favourites is uh, the Match of the Day. Uh, you know, the theme tune. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. But you can play it in a variety of different ways. It, it sort of lends itself to the, to the classical genre. You know. Lovely. Oh. You know, that's very nice. Uh, I also personally prefer the lounge version, you know. It's a much more sort of relaxed, relaxed version. Yeah. I don't know whether the band can join in here. Yeah, yeah. So let's try it. Oh, yeah! <laughs> All right. This is nice. say that's not my favorite my favorite version of the match of the day is the jewish folk song version oh. of match of the day if you transpose it into a minor key you get this and it doesn't sound like a football programme. No, exactly. Um, and, but I suppose one of my favourites would be Ski Sunday. Yeah, we oh, Ski oh, Sunday we heard this. Is, is an absolute corker, isn't it? It's a classic. I mean, you know, every sort of, you know... You know it's, pretty, you know, oh, it's amazing. 
Mm. It's a beautiful song, yeah. beautiful piece of music. It was written in the 70s, mm. um, and it was actually written as a kind of a parody of Bach. And it was actually, uh, uh, it, was, it was used, the BBC used it for Ski Sunday. And actually, it's, it is modelled on Bach's Toccata and Fugue in D minor. Yeah, of course it is. As you, yeah. as you well knew. So, you know, if you, if you listen to it, you know, this is, this is the original. That's it, there you go. If you, if you know, this is the Bach's Toccata and Fugue. It's virtually the same in the minor key, and if you play the Ski Sunday theme in the minor key, then you get Bach. You know. Ladies and gentlemen, come on. Right, there you go. So uh, the actually the other male voice that you heard there is the voice of Chris Evans, who. Uh, was one of the presenters who took over Top Gear after Jeremy Clarkson and the gang uh, left. So it all does come full circle now as we come all the way back round to the subject of Top Gear again. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. Don't forget to check out the page on the website where you'll see some embedded videos and some other stuff there that you can feast your eyes upon. And uh, don't forget also to go around in your daily life talking like Jeremy Clarkson. Uh, you could go into work and say, hello, everyone. I've arrived at work. Would anyone like a cup of tea? Because I'm going to make it like this. Um, you could do that if you like. Uh, you could also uh, subscribe to the mailing list for Luke's English Podcast on my website. You'll see in the top right-hand corner, it says uh, subscribe to the mailing list. Stick your email address in there. And then whenever I upload some new stuff, like an episode of the podcast or something like that, then uh, you'll get... An email in your inbox with a nice uh, clickable link that will take you exactly to the right place. And then you can just go about listening to the podcast and consuming the contents of the page at your own leisure. Thank you so much for listening to this one. Uh, leave your thoughts in the comments section. OK, but for now, it's time to say goodbye. Bye, 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 bye. Thanks for listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk.